All right, thank you, Nathan. Um, good morning or good afternoon, and uh, thank you all for joining me on this Friday before uh, Thanksgiving. Um, we're going to briefly go over some things, and I'm going to try to cover some basis on some things that are required and not required, but recommended from uh, different from different um, regulatory agencies. But primarily, this is focused on just the uh, what what is commonly known as the ESG, or uh, you know, or we sort of just say one small part of the ESG score. Um, sustainability. So the, the driver behind this will be the sustainability, and we'll um, kind of begin from there with a couple of terms and things that are going to happen from that point. All right, I'm going to go ahead and switch over to my presentation. Bear with me just for a moment. Okay. So, again, energy audits are kind of just one small part of a sustainability program. Um, and the, and the, the green score or the carbon footprint are kind of those terms that you already heard mentioned several times. That's, that's kind of the one part of this that we're specializing in. And what it, it really boils down to is how efficient how efficient is your company or your organization running in, re, in regards to impact on the environment. Um, when we look at when we look at some aspects of this, there's there's going to be about four key areas we're going to focus in on. And it's going to probably be mostly uh, very familiar stuff that you may have heard people talking about before, but uh, primarily we're going to get water, water and, uh, and amongst that water and wastewater. Wastewater is a big part of this. We have to try and help people kind of get a grasp on how much wastewater they're producing, how can we reduce it, how can I recycle more, and measure and not be charged for so much of it. Um, and then, of course, the lighting is a big part of the energy audit. We look at your lighting fixtures and types of lighting and your schedule for running that lighting. Uh, heating and air conditioning equipment, HVAC equipment is another big aspect of it. And um, the other, uh, some other factors around that would be your what we call a BMS. BMS stands for Building Management System when we get to that part of the presentation. And the, all these areas together encompass an energy audit that, that is a complete program that where you're evaluating all the energies you're consuming and uh, looking at ways to conserve those. Uh, some definitions around this. This you've heard, you may have heard mentioned in the pre-blast into this. If you were reading the pre-blast, you saw that ASHRAE was the was the uh, organization with ASHRAE Level Two to be specific was the organization we use as the benchmark for our measurement. ASHRAE has been around for a very long time. Um, it stands for the American Society of Heating and Refrigeration Air Conditioning Engineers. These are the folks that help dictate around the Energy Star equipment. So when you buy a refrigerator and it has an Energy Star rating on the front of it, that's coming from these folks right here. Um, or like any other appliance, your heating and air conditioning appliances. So when you buy those, they're coming with an Energy Star compliance score. And you know, just like those devices that have an Energy Star score, when you get an Energy, when you get a um, ASHRAE Level Two uh, audit, you get an Energy Star score, and and, and you're looking at that score, and it helps you compare yourself to others in your same line of work or your same type of um, business unit. You can say, oh, we had a star rating of 72, and that's borderline. That means you need to make, make improvement. You know, so, whereas your, if you had an energy star score of a 92 up to a 100, you know, that's you're running on the highest efficiency you possibly can. So those are things that we don't want to look at when we get into the actual terminology of what we're, ta what we're talking and discussing here. The energy audit itself is a detailed analysis of the energy of performance of the organization equipment systems or process. Again, it's just uh, it's looking at all the different areas of consumption and how well it's balanced with what you're doing in, in regards to conserving those, those items. Um, EEM and ECM are used interchangeably with, within this type of audit and other types of audit, similar audits. Um, the, we'll, we'll use both terms interchangeably throughout the presentation, but the EEM and ECM is just that. It's an energy conservation measure versus an energy efficiency measure. They, they do kind of, um, they do kind of uh, I guess, reflect one another. Sustainable, of course, is the practice of using natural resources responsible today, so they are available for future generations tomorrow. Okay. The... Um, ASHRAE Level 2 is broken out into three, uh, excuse me, let me back up. The ASHRAE Audit Sodomary Table is broken into three levels, and the three levels are Level 1, Level 2, and Level 3. Um, of those levels, we have rapid, uh, let's see, Level 1 is kind of a 
uh, just a general overview. It, you can do these in-house. You don't need someone certified. You can actually look at the um, you can look at these and, and actually figure these out for yourself. Rapid assessment of your building injury systems. Your you know with with basic qualifications and some, maybe some um, electrical background, you can do the level one yourself. Try to find out do I need to do the level two. And level two and level three are way, uh, a little bit more involved. And for level two is what we specialize in. The, um, we look at more of the, the EEMs, the energy efficiency measures for each of your systems, and we spotlight on the operational discrepancies. And then we look at outlining priorities for limited resources, next steps, identification of the EEMs, and more thorough data collection analysis. So what that would look like is um, if you elected to use we would, if you chose us to come to your um, energy audit, which is one of our biggest um, avenues that we offer now, we would come in and spend a day or two walking around with one of your professionals. Um, could be an EHS person, could be a maintenance person, facilities person, usually that's who, who we're tasked with. And we would go over each one of these areas and start taking data collection. We would look at Water faucets, we would look at flushes on your type of, your, your type of commodes and your type of urinals. We would look at um, kitchen facilities, if you have kitchen or any kind of dining, dining facilities on site. Uh, we would look at irrigation systems. We would look at water consumers from the aspect of processed waters. We would look at your chillers. We would look at your steam generation, your steam, cooling water from cooling tower process, things like those things. These are all part of the data collection process that usually takes a, a day at minimum on, uh, on an average location that has roughly less than half a million square feet. Warehouses are different from production facilities. Warehouses, we have to look at lighting aspects and control the lighting um, versus some of the other stuff where we're dealing with process waters for a, process, for some, for a manufacturing facility. Um, and we highlight on areas, each one of those areas individually. We look at the water and then we look at the, it, the lighting and then we look at the, the outside re, uh, as far as sunlight. Are you, uh, do you have a lot of sunlight coming into your facility and how to maximize those different types of things? Okay, some areas of ECMs, uh, identifying energy inefficiencies. Uh, again, this is where we kind of outside, outside coming in, we look at, we look at uh, each one of those ideas, uh, each one of those areas and try to Make sure we cover each one of those um, and, and accurately, okay? And then we come back and say we also have the ECMs, how to implement those. On your report, it will tell you how you can help um, implement each one of these conser uh, conservation measures. Then enhancing indoor environmental quality, this is as simple as putting in something what we call an economizer. Um, an economizer is a feature on your heat and air conditioning equipment that allows it to pull outside air in. And in, in, it's, just, you know, it's very instrumental, especially if you live in what we call the modern to temperate climate zone, which is, you know, pretty much defines the southeast up, up until, you know, up until uh, probably the northwest, that you can turn on the this function where it pulls outside air in. It's not usually, it's usually close to room temperature, but it helps uh, free up and uh, remove um, contaminants within the air. All right, so it helps get remove dust and other uh, other other items from your actual air naturally. Now, long term long term sustainability and planning. That's also part of this. So we're looking years down decades down the road. How are we staying ahead of our consumption of these natural resources and recycling those resources as well? Uh, there's each part of the ECMs are broken out into multiple pieces. I'll, I'll try to go over those as much as I can. They're, they're very detailed and without wasting a lot of time, I want to make sure we kind of cover those. Um, one of the first things you can look at is the nighttime audit. That's one of the first things we we say. Hey, what is your nighttime usage of these of your lighting, your heat and air? Do y'all turn? Do you go to you know? If your building is not occupied those hours, why are we trying to heat and cool that space? Or why are we trying to leave lights on in certain areas that really aren't necessary? We want to look at those kind of, you know, big, big picture items right out the gate. Uh, generatorial practices, uh, startup times, power down times, those are all part of your functioning. Um, we're going to talk to your, we're going to advise you to talk to your, your utility provider. Um, sometimes these utility providers are good about uh, providing energy audits on a small scale free or at low cost to you to help you reduce, to consume less power or use less of, uh, of their product, all right? Um, natural gas is another one of those that we have to talk about. We, we get into a lot of natural gas waste 
and we, um, you know, there's an effort to reduce as much carbon footprint as, we, of course, you want to reduce the amount of natural gas you're consuming. Um, and we also want to talk about water. You know, again, water is one of the big ones we look at. We look at water and steam as part of that. Um, a lot of companies use some type of steam generation for different processes in their plant, and, and the, the implementation of steam traps to recover that is crucial in getting a, a good energy score on your um, audit there. Lining is a, the part where the other next one we'll um, briefly touch on. Uh, of course, solids are very familiar with the LED versus incandescent lighting or fluorescent lighting for that matter. And the, the drive to push for LED is, um, you know, we, we wanna make sure that folks are using the correct LED fixture for correct applications. Um, a good example of one that we find a lot that's not utilized is the outside exterior lighting for nighttime. And these are units we would call uh, wall packs. A wall pack is a unit that mounts to the building and lights up the outside of the building. And of course, a parking lot or you know whatever the security lighting you may have, high pressure sodium fixtures are still prevalent out here in the industry. They're the, they're the ones that emit a lot of heat and a lot of waste in, as far as their function, where a high output LED fixture would have served way better in that particular role. And we will actually give you the numbers. How much, how much can you save and how quickly will changing out to HOLEDs, high output LEDs, how quickly will that return your investment on your money by changing out those high pressure sodium lamps? Um, they're, they're extremely wasteful just, you know. And of course, uh, we uh, HID, which is high intensity discharge lamp, same thing. We wanna make sure we're changing those out as, if, if, as soon as possible with the LED fixtures that are available now. Fluorescents are less return on investment. Fluorescents are not as wasteful as some of these other ones we mentioned. However, um, there are much better models of LED. If you're buying new fixtures, of course, go LED. And if you have an LED, if you have a fluorescent fixture go bad, rather than replace the ballast or replace components of it, swap it out to an LED fixture. The, the, the savings will definitely um, accumulate real quickly for you. Some other things I want to talk about in lighting real quick is light tubes, skylight panels, and other roof fixtures. We're going to look to see if you're utilizing any of these types of options. They're really cool. Um, light tubes pipe in light from outside through a tube into your house, and it doesn't have any. It's using a reflective cone and a prism a lens to to um, to project the light from outside to inside. These tubes can only be like 12 inches in diameter, and yet can put out enough light to light up you know, three or 400 square feet of area inside with zero power consumption. Skylight panels are also good for manufacturing and warehousing applications, bringing the natural lighting from outside. So you would, you would, you would replace panels on your roofing with skylights and to allow that light in and give you that benefit. Um, and there's a lot of energy saving programs out there to help you pay for these things. Um, different funding programs come from um, uh, state-funded state organizations and federal-funded organizations to help pay for some of the stuff. Some checklists you need to look at from a very small scale that we look at. We look at fans, we look at lights, even in the office cubicle area, because there's a lot of waste there. We look to make sure you got the monitors that are using the Energy Star, they have a good Energy Star ready. Uh, PCs, desktop PCs, or remote, whatever you want to use, uh, whatever type of designs you use, we want to make sure you're using the Energy Star, the best Energy Star ready components for your office and your um, other types of areas that are like that. These are big consumers, especially if they're left on 24 7 and they don't hibernate. Um, schedules of operation are big on what we do. We'll ask you for you know, occupied hours versus unoccupied hours, and we'll base a lot of our, our, our numbers as far as your, your score are based off how well you manage those hours, those unoccupied hours. Plug load, that's again, I've already mentioned some of those devices. The utilizing of smart power strips and other smart devices help reduce the number of uh, that, that, that score to make sure that it gets down to a lower, uh, you get a, a really good energy star score. So you know, just be mindful that we're, you know, we're looking at just not just the office space, we're looking at the warehousing, we're looking at the um, the, the workstations out there on the process floor, and of course in distribution center or warehousing, we're looking at the, um, the, the logistical side of stuff as far as what type of equipment you're using for your, uh, your, on your powered industrial trucks or other devices and how efficient they are operating. HVAC is a big part of your ratings of unoccupied, managing, managing your times run so, and your um, hours, and of course also managing temperatures. 
at different areas. So we want to make sure that we do, there's of course a list here of some basic things that could be done, but um, overall, again, we're looking at the big picture of um, building management system, which is a system that controls our HVAC occupied, unoccupied hours, and our lighting occupied, unoccupied hours. So there's lots of things we can do to help our, our HVAC, HVAC system work more efficiently. Insulation, insulation is one of them. R values, we look at the R value of insulation, which is, you know, your again, it's, it's the ability to, to recover or recoup heat or cooling. Um, we also look at the, do you have solar films on your on your windows to help reduce the amount of um, sunlight that's heating up your area your spaces unnecessarily that you have to cool in the, in the summertime. Um, we look at uh, uh, thermal. We can have we have thermal um, scanning equipment. We can look and see leaks, uh, major leaks within the building. We can see thermal footprints of that. And there's other ways we can help also help find um, the waste associated with HVAC equipment. Um, there's a lot of low, when we do a report for you for a company after we do an energy audit, there's a lot of things that we'll look at and we do recommendations and they're usually geared or keyed from most important or most value, most return on investment down to the lowest value. So as you go through, you're just like, there's some really small things you could do, but they add up. All those little things add up over time. Okay. Um, VFDs are a big part of this value added as well. Variable frequency drives or VFDs or variable speed drives that also may be known as, it's more often, you find it more often now on HVAC equipment and not just production equipment. Exhaust fans and other types of uh, equipment like that, VFDs is the right way to go. You're going you're gonna to save so much money by using these devices. It's a small investment to get a huge return on the backside. And uh, let's see, I've already mentioned the BMS or building management systems. If you have those, um, you're utilizing those, you're scheduling those to optimize your um, particular part of your systems is, is a way to, a huge investment as far as saving on money. Uh, oh, and uh, train systems, if you're, if you're a train um, utilizer, in other words, your rooftop HVAC equipment or whatever, your, whatever, however it is, they are compatible. Train has its own BMS systems. They're pretty, pretty, uh, um, they're they're user friendly from the aspect you can they have complete capability to run off your phone with an app you can go and change your settings at any given time your, and check on environments in your plant within any time so train has a uh, probably a, one of the best bms systems out there right now if you have train systems i would look at using that network card it can be added in to any existing train system you can add in these network cards for any system to bring it into it at their their style bms wastewater and water so we look at the aerators on your sinks. We look at the areas on, on faucets and the bathrooms and things like that. Gallons per flush, liters per flush on urinals and toilets. We want to make sure those are below one gallon per flush and ideally. Steam traps or recovery, those, again, I mentioned those are really part of a process-related item, but that's a big one. If we get condensate, some people call it a condensate trap. We usually look at condensate recovery tanks. Wastewater. Um, wastewater. There are several areas that we see a lot of waste in that we need, we would look at and help you come alongside. If you're discharging a lot of wastewater or or at least putting it in totes and, and having it sent off to be incinerated or some other device, we want to look at ways we can help you recover that money that you spent and waste on it by doing a pretreatment. Um, pretreatment type systems are when you actually will discharge into the sanitary sewer but you're going to pretreat the water to make sure you're not being, you're not dumping oil or any other contaminants into their systems. Um, types of ways we do that are membranes, the membrane oil separators, or evaporators. Um, I'm more of an advocate for the membrane oil separator. It does require a wastewater license to do that, but it's easily obtained. Most folks, most maintenance guys, could pass the the wastewater treatment test pretty pretty easily for bio, for excuse me for physical chemical. Um, and what I mean by that is that there are two levels of wastewater operators. There's physical chemical, which is uh, separating oil from water, and there's biological. And the biological is what you would more likely find if you were working in sewer type uh, systems. You're separating human waste from actual water. Um, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about separating oil and other contaminants from industrial process water. Evaporators work a little bit differently. They, instead of separating them, they actually cook the water off and leave the sludge behind. And when the sludge is behind, you put it in a barrel and you would send that off to be incinerated. But it's concentrated. Instead of sending off the, 
when you would normally send off a water that's contaminated, you're sending off the sludge and you recovered the water, recycled it, and saved yourself a lot of money and saved, you know, of course, um, also reduced your carbon footprint significantly based off of uh, your, your, your lack or your reduced waste from water. Irrigation systems, um, management of your irrigation systems is another part of this that we have to look into as far as your scheduled runtime. If you're in an area that has a lot of rainfall, it would benefit us to, have one, have a setting within our irrigation systems that either shut the system off during rainfall but so you're not irrigating when it's raining. And another part of that is to actually uh, not run the system during rainy seasons. During the, during the spring season when, when we have a lot of rainfall, you wouldn't run your irrigation system. Cooling tower losses is something we've seen significant changes in. How we do that is we monitor our wastewater discharge that's um, put in a prismordial chamber. It's a, it's a type of flow system that we can check. check. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, prism, I mean it's trapezoidal. It's trapezoidal uh, flow chamber. What it does is it monitors and, and, and actually records the, num uh, the number of gallons that we're discharging into the sanitary sewer. How this saves you lots of money is that you are charged by on, for your sewer systems by how much water you actually consumed in. So get this. In a metering type system, you look at the meter, let's say I use 1,000 meters, or excuse me, 1,000 gallons of water, 1,000 gallons of water in a day. They're gonna charge me for that same 1,000 gallons to be, just if I, as if I discharge all that 1,000 gallons, I discharge it into the sanitary sewer. Now, if I lost 500 gallons of water through evaporation in my in my uh, cooling tower, I'm still charged a thousand for that thousand gallons instead. They don't know how much I lost in evaporation. So by monitoring and actually recording the the discharge, and if DHEC or whoever your governing body is, if they accept that as your monitoring, you will only be charged for the amount that you are discharging into the sanitary sewer, not for what you're actually paying for on your um in your on your in, on your incoming supply lines. So it's kind of weird how I mean, you think about how it works, but you're charged on a one to one ratio if you can't prove it otherwise. But if you prove to you otherwise that I'm only discharging five hundred gallons, well then they can't charge you for the other five hundred gallons and you're reducing your your waste, your course, and you're already proving you're reducing your cost and you're and you're proving that you're you know having significant losses through evaporation. So that's a, gr a great way to um, also do your um, uh, ROI on your, your return on your investment on these systems. Uh, process water treatment and recycling, of course, a lot of these, uh, what I've already touched on with the water separator, the, the membrane separator, so you can keep recycling the water that you're instead of discharging into sanitary sewer and recoup a lot of the money that way. All right, so uh, the, what are the overall benefits? There's four parts, of, four keynote parts of an ASHRAE audit. The identifying your inefficiencies. I've gone over a multiple. Oops, sorry. I've gone over multiple parts of those. Uh, and you know, the level two is really good at identifying those. Level three is super, super tight, stringent stuff. If you are a foreign-owned company, um, there may be drivers from organizations called CE, which is your basically your European standard, your European standard. Our European partners are good at uh, uh, challenging us to meet the same standards they are. This ASHRAE Level 2 meets the same standards as CE on their side. So when they say, what do you, you know, how are we, we need to do an energy audit for our American counterparts, this is what we're doing. It's a Level 2 audit, and that Level 2 audit meets CE standards. It's translatable. In other words, they can look at their standards and what they've done and the numbers, the reports, and all that cross-references over to, to what they're doing. So this is very helpful when you're our, um, for foreign-owned companies when they want to make sure that we are doing our part here. Uh, implementing the ECMs, that, again, once we identify those, is, hey, how can you put this into play? The report helps you do that. Report tells you what to do, steps, big, big to little, start at the very top, work your way down. Enhancing indoor environmental quality. Well, that's the same, same thing. We're trying to reduce our carbon impact, our carbon footprint, our impact, but at the same time, we want to have good quality air, good quality water, whatever, for our people inside the environment. So that enhancing that to where it's a, it's a very positive environment is part of that. Long-term sustainability planning. Again, this is all part of that huge, big piece of puzzle called sustainability. And in that sustainability is the energy and consumption of footprint, carbon footprint part that we're talking about here. Um, these, all these pieces are, are huge, are a major step in making your company energy star or energy efficient. 
Now, sustainability, I don't want to get too far off into this one because it, it is huge, it is massive, and there's too much for that for one webinar. This is something your, your one person would probably have to help you actually um, go through. The, this person would, you know, I don't know what their title may be, but it's usually posed to EHS people first, but the next part of that is, you know, how do I keep, how do I manage this entire sustainable person? How do I, how do I manage this entire program for an entire company? Um, so sustainable, it's an, you have to make sure that someone's in charge of it, someone owns this program and is in charge of the sustainability program, does the energy audits, and then does all these other parts. There's one key part of this, you need, if you're looking at the questions on the right-hand side of the slide, the second one down is kind of the keynote I'll, I'll tell you. And you're asking, say, well, what are the three types of audits? So what are these all about? An external audit is when I come in there. That's, okay, you hired me to come in, and I'm going to do an energy audit for you, and all those things I just mentioned to you, I'm going to identify those and give you a report. Then you got an internal audit, which is you doing the internal audit. You're walking around, and you're doing a, a kind of like a, your own internal check. So like, hey, I, I know this. This is a big waste right here. Right? We need to knock – we need to – put in a heat recovery unit for this. We're wasting so much energy out, the, out this furnace or out this oven. Um, this is big picture items that you just, you don't ignore. You choose to go ahead and do a self, uh, excuse me, an internal audit and actually um, take care of those items without having to bring an external in there. And the third one you can do for sustainability is, is a self audit. It's when you're doing basically looking at your practices or how you're setting the example for your people or whatever it is you're doing that you're, you're showing that you're proactive in this. And it could be as simple as you turning off the irrigation system when you see that there's a waste of, because of the, 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 it's raining or it's gonna be rain, rains in the forecast for the next three days. So turn off the irrigation system and save you know, a couple hundred gallons of water. Those are all part of that self internal audit you can do to help maintain the lights. Or flipping off the lights when you leave the office, same thing, making sure you're being the, that person that's responsible and setting a good example there. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and give you this one plug. This is the company. This is the software I typically use when I do an energy audit. Uh, EMAT software is available um, on. My screen is toggling on me. <laughs> so, EMAT software is uh, what we use. is app. It is app based, which means I can use it on my Android phone. I could use it on my iPhone. Um, it is also PC friendly. So um, EMAT software is what I typically use for an audit. Um, now, the software is only as good as the person putting the, in, the data in. So if you, if you skip a lot of the data key points, you're not really utilizing the, the software to its full capabilities. You're just kind of skipping mm -hmm. over some steps. So it's key that, is that you understand what it's asking you to input into this audit, auditor. Um, but again, this, is, this, is, this app is not conclusive. It does not just give you a score. You don't run this app and all of a sudden you got a score at the end of it. There are engineering um, models behind it. So once all the data is entered, engineers have to compile the data into more or less spreadsheet or other types of values to run the numbers and make sure that, that it jives, that everything comes up the same, and um, you know that you get an actual accurate score of what you're doing. So EMAT software is it is it is backed by people, actual engineers um, that do the calculations and part of it. Okay, but there's, there's more about that is available through EMAT. If you want to talk to them, I can put you in contact with them. All you got to do is send me a question or ask at the very end of the presentation. I can put you in contact with a couple of their people that are very helpful in explaining how EMAT works. Um, so types, just a real quick, uh, lately who I've worked with on these types of systems on these energy audits. Uh, these are just customers that I've, I've asked for their permission on how to do, on what to um Basically, I've asked for permission to can I use our name and tell you, you know, how, what we've been able to do and provide with them, and they've agreed. Bosch and Lom out of Woodruff, they're, of course, you may be very familiar with them. They make the uh, um, various uh, eye care products. And in this particular this their distribution center in Woodruff, um, we helped them with uh, an all encompassing energy audit on their distribution center. That was over 2 million square feet, and we were able to provide them with a report and help them get, get to some returnable energy con conservation measures. Um, is also just an opportunity for them to benchmark if what they were doing was good. Like they had a lot of things already in place. It, you know, it wasn't it wasn't a super old facility, but they had good LED light fixtures. You know, they had some good lighting, ambient lighting, and they had a good BMS or building management system in there controlling their heat and air air conditioning. So there were some big parts already done, but meanwhile they missed some small parts. You know, it was like oh, we found multiple faucets had the aerators removed. 
They're like, well, that's a problem because the aerators removed after your gallons per minute restriction. So we're able to identify those, just, you know, things like that. They're like, okay, we kind of missed the mark on that part. So it's helpful for us to come in and do stuff like that. Spirax Arco, they're out of Blythewood, South Carolina. They are, um, they were, uh, we had a huge project with them around water and wastewater. And we were able to um, identify some significant waste around steam and around their wastewater treatment and get them back, um, get them a, a, a lot of money back by tra- by changing two habits on, on their steam recovery systems and on their wastewater to get them to recover their wastewater instead of shipping it out in totes. Graphic packaging, now they're um, a process equipment that are mostly printing operation. Um, that, so this process, this one in, is in progress right now, and we're helping them to kind of identify, again, a lot of the waste with just mostly water at the very beginning. And then it gets a higher level with the um, with the the energy conserving. Now we're going to you know uh, when I mentioned train uh, HVAC building management system, that's just one of them we're working with them to help them get because some of their systems were older and some of their systems are newer. Not all of it's compatible with with the train system, but train came out with a fix for that and is able to make all their older systems compatible and work on the new building management system. So. That's what I mean by we're helping them get find these these savings that they didn't no, wouldn't normally find and explore. So all these things are all key parts of, a, of an energy audit and um, and why and why it's important to do an internal and an external have a, have someone like me come in and help you identify all these over um, all these big big um, these big picture items. So um, I know I cover a lot of material and I I went through a lot of parts of it. I only and, and there may be some more, more questions, but uh, really, that's kind of where I wanted to harp on was just the energy audit, the level two energy audits, but it goes in much, much more in depth. And if you're, if you need more information on that, I'm certainly available to answer those by email or by phone call. Um, with this, I'm going to turn it back over to Nathan. Uh, give me just a moment to close out and stop sharing. All right, thank you everybody that joined us today. Thank you, Matt, for that presentation. I do have a couple of questions that were brought up. Uh, at the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned the different levels of the ASHRAE assessment. Is there somewhere that we could go or is there a checklist or an assessment for that initial level one piece? Uh, yes, actually there is. It's Energy Star. It, um, it, is, it is actually, um, Oh gosh, um, <laughs> it's a great question. I had I had it pulled up in my browser earlier. Let me pull it up just for a second on my side. I'll tell you what it is in just a second. But one of the ones I, I utilize a good bit, um, energystar.gov, energystar.gov. All right, and it's right on that website? Pardon? The, the level one assessment, is is there somewhere that they need to go or it's pretty apparent once you get to that site? Oh, no. Uh, so once you get energy startup, uh, you can search within there, ASHRAE Level 2, ASHRAE Level 1. But okay. if you, KNW, there's other sources. Honestly, if you Google, if you just search the ASHRAE Level 1, 2, and 3, there's going to be multiple ones that pop up. The energy star dot one is the one I would trust the most. Gotcha. Okay. That makes sense. And then if a company is doing this, how often would you recommend that a company redo their energy audit? Is it something that needs to be done every year, two years, three years? Um, great question. So the, that that really depends on the duty or the cycle, the, basically the environment that the that the company is in. If you look at the standards and what's out there, um, it is you would I, I would argue that you would need to redo it after any major changes to your building. Any major changes, whether it be lighting or whether it be HVAC equipment or anything like that, you would need to do it or occupied hours or expansions, anything like that. Otherwise, um, an and energy audit probably won't change a whole lot in, until something like, until something in the environment changes, whether it be the, the size of the building. So, uh, yeah, I would, I would say anytime a major change is made to the building that, or, or an expansion or anything like that, that's going to be a, a, um, a, a driving factor in my decision to have an energy audit. After I've made a huge improvement, let's say I changed all my fixtures out and, and or had some uh, a major renovation, definitely, definitely want to go back and make sure I've got to, you know, look at that, uh, do another energy audit, come back and look at it again, and see if my energy star score actually came up. Gotcha. That makes sense. So after a company implements this, you would recommend that they come back and do an audit again just to see what the difference is from implementation to now. 
Absolutely. All right. Well, those were the questions that I had. Again, thank you to everybody who joined us today. Thank you, Matt, for that excellent presentation. You guys are, everyone who's here saw our emails, so keep an eye out for the next few that are coming up. This one is the last one of the year, so thank you all for joining us, especially knowing that it is the weekend before Thanksgiving. I know a lot of people are on vacation. Our next webinar will be on record keeping presented by Anthony Wilkes. That'll be done in January. And then in February, we'll have a discussion on audiometric testing and hearing conservation with one of our other consultants, Jay Jordan. Again, thank you everyone for joining us today. Have a great weekend and stay safe out there.